So hello everyone, I'm Catherine Tefano from the Ridgefield Historical Society. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon for the Heroes of Ned's Mountain with historian Jack Sanders. A Fairfield County native and graduate of Holy Cross, Jack Sanders retired in 2014 after 45 years as an editor of the Ridgefield Press. He's written nine books on history and natural history, including Wicked Ridgefield, Ridgefield Chronicles, Hidden History of Ridgefield, published by the History Press, The Secrets of Wildflowers, published by Lions Press, Hedge Maids and Fairy Candles, published by McGraw Hill, and Five Village Walks, published by the Ridgefield Historical Society and available at the Scott House and Books on the Common. He also created and administers the 10 year old Old Ridgefield Group on Facebook, which has more than 6,000 followers. He and his wife, Sally, a retired newspaper editor who is on the board of the Ridgefield Historical Society, live in a 250 year old farmhouse in Ridgefield. In addition, the Historical Society is so grateful to Jack who shares his work regularly on our website and in our weekly e-blasts with his historical nuggets series, articles such as racism in the 20th century in Ridgefield and video tours of the Peter Parley Schoolhouse among other programs. Before we begin, I'd like to give special thanks to our co-sponsors, Ridgefield Library and Ridgebury Congregational Church, as well as the Connecticut Humanities and Fairfield County Bank for generously supporting this program. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be available on the Historical Society's website and YouTube channel next week. At the end of the hour long recorded presentation, Jack will be joining us and taking questions via the Q&A function located on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. So enjoy the presentation. Ridgefielders have called it Ned's Mountain for a century and a half. Really just a steep, mostly wooded hill, the mountain reaches 962 feet above sea level in the northern part of the town, overlooking pastures dotted with multi-million dollar homes and elegant horse barns, and capped with a modern house offering views for miles around. Those views were much different nearly two centuries ago when black men and women fleeing enslavement in the South sought refuge on Ned's Mountain and where four African-American boys grew up and went off to fight in the Civil War. Two would not return. We're walking down Ned's Lane, which is a little tiny road off Ned's Mountain Road in Ridgebury. And off to the back of me would be Ridgebury proper, uh, where the church is. Off this way, to the west is Ridgebury Road. Straight ahead would be the town of Ridgefield and beyond it, Long Island Sound. And over here, we have Ned's Mountain, the top of Ned's Mountain. We're probably actually on the side of what is called Ned's Mountain. About 200 years ago was where a family named Armstrong lived, Ned and Betsy Armstrong. And they, it is believed, had a station on the Underground Railroad, Ridgefield's only stop on the Underground Railroad and one that was only recently rediscovered. Ned's Mountain and the related Ned's Mountain Road and Ned's Lane are the only names on a map of the town that recall African Americans. Even then, they represent a past that the town has forgotten or ignored. Ridgefield was founded in 1708. The vast majority of early settlers were white who came to Connecticut in the 1600s. Of them, much has been written in town histories. A few early Ridgefielders, however, were African-Americans. Some free, but more 
enslaved. African Americans have been an important part of Richfield's past since at least the 1730s, probably much earlier. Yet little has been documented and even less written about their lives and their contributions to the community and the nation during the town's first two centuries. Richfield's records in the 1700s rarely mention non-European residents, be they free blacks, slaves, or Native Americans. That's partly because relatively few African or indigenous people lived here, and some of those who did were not identified by race in any records. However, the lives of African Americans are harder to uncover and document mostly because they have not been treated equally with whites in the keeping of town records. Even blacks who were free, tax-paying landowners, weren't considered full citizens and were prevented by Connecticut tradition and laws from voting or holding office. The African Americans who lived on Ned's Mountain a century after the town's founding were all free men and women, but without doubt they had their roots among the enslaved. Some may have once been slaves themselves. This satellite picture shows Ned's Lane at Ned's Mountain, largely wooded today, but probably much more open in the early 19th century. Today, a boarded-up outbuilding stands in the woods at the edge of the road, perhaps on or near the home site of Edward and Betsy Armstrong. Though long gone, the Armstrong's modest compound on the mountain seems both symbolic and a real representation of the African-American experience in Ridgefield. At least Uncle Ned, as he was known, probably came into this world as a slave, one of at least 58 enslaved men, women, and children known to have lived in Ridgefield during the 18th century. By the time he made his home on Ned's Mountain, Ned Armstrong was free, as was his wife. They lived in a northern section of the town part of which had been cleared from the wilderness by a free black family a century before them, a family named Jacqueline that contributed at least three young men to the fight for American independence. Ned and Betsy's compound itself produced at least four soldiers in the war that led to the emancipation of millions of African Americans. In describing Ridgefield's first two centuries, local and regional historians have limited their mention of African Americans almost solely to a few who were enslaved, and then more as a curiosity and never as contributing members to the community, or even as part of a social or moral problem that hung over the community, colony, state, and nation. What's more, Richfield's historians have virtually ignored African Americans' part in settling the town, and especially their noteworthy contributions in the fight for Americans' independence. One historian made no mention at all of blacks in the 18th century, Richfield, and actually deleted refer references to them in reprinting a report describing the state of the town in the year 1800. A remarkable example of how Ridgefield's African-American past has been overlooked are the Armstrongs, who helped an unknown number of men and women escaping slavery in the South and whose grandchildren fought and died in the Civil War. Uncle Ned and Aunt Betsy Armstrong risked arrest and imprisonment as they sheltered slaves who were fleeing from bondage in the South and seeking freedom in the North in the first half 
of the 19th century. The Armstrong Station on the Underground Railroad was in Ridgebury, somewhere on his namesake mountain. The stop included a small, well-hidden cave where runaways could elude pursuing slave catchers, probably on the hillside to the east of the house. Uncle Ned was, quote, a man who devoted a life to an idea, the freedom of his colored brothers of the South, said an 1879 article in the New York Tribune. So well did he plan and execute that, to this day, near neighbors only knew Uncle Ned and Aunt Betsy as good, kind, colored people, handy to have around to assist with the house or farm work. Little is known about the origins of Edward and Betsy Armstrong. Edward, or Ned, was born around 1782 in Ridgefield, according to the 1850 census. He may have been free at birth, but it's possible he was a child of an enslaved mother, and thus born enslaved. The estate of Mary Keeler, widow of T Timothy Keeler, listed in 1787, quote, the Negro boy named Ned, as among the property she left at her death. Ned was bequeathed to her daughter, Hannah Keeler Wilson, and it is possible that Ned later gained his freedom from her and took the formal name Edward Armstrong. The 1840 census shows Edward living with his wife in Ridgebury, probably on what is today called Ned's Mountain, with a family that included three boys, one under 10 and two between 10 and 20, and three girls, two under 10 and one between 10 and 20. As you can see here, only the name of the head of the household was provided in the 1840 census. Betsy was also said to have been born here. She, too, may have been enslaved. The year of her birth is a bit of a mystery. Her gravestone in Ridgebury Cemetery and her death record in the town hall say she was 90 years old when she died in 1857. That would have made her birth year around 1767. However, the 1850 census taker said she was 68, a more likely age for a woman who had a 70-year-old husband. Since the post-mortem information on her age was probably second-hand, the gravestone and death record could easily have been mistaken. She or her husband were probably interviewed in person for the census. They weren't for their deaths. The Armstrongs were likely living on Ned's Mountain by the 1830s. The exact location of their home is not certain, but tradition and one land record suggests that it was off the east side of Ned's Lane, a short dead-end road running off the southern end of Ned's Mountain Road. This map, published in 1856, shows a building on the site that I suspect was their homestead. Probably somewhere to the east of the homestead was the cave where, according to at least two accounts, the people escaping from slavery could temporarily be hidden and housed on their journey north. Historian Silvio Bedini knew of Ned, but not of his activities. In his 1958 history, Ridgefield and Review, Bedini wrote, Ned's Mountain derives its name from a Negro man named Ned who lived in the area. Four Negro families made their homes on Ned's Mountain during the 19th century. By 1850, there appear to have been at least three houses on the Ned's Lane compound, 
occupied by 13 African Americans, most of them Armstrong children and grandchildren. Besides Edward and Betsy Armstrong themselves, the compound that year included Betsy Watson, the Armstrong's 34-year-old daughter, and her four children, Melander, Mary, George, and John. John Watson, then nine, grew up to serve in the Civil War. Another Armstrong daughter, Carolyn Smalley, 32, and her husband John Smalley, 45, lived there with children Samuel, Catherine, John, and Mary. John Smalley became one of the last victims of the Civil War. The 1879 New York Tribune article described the Armstrong's home site. A more interesting mountain is not found in the state. Standing upon its top, you can trace the water coursing west across fine dairy farms and through the valleys of the Titicus, a branch of the Croton, thus finding its way to our homes in New York. To the south, kissing the sea at Norwalk, after starting many a wheel to spinning. To the east, through Myrie Brook, Danbury, Brookfield, joining the Housatonic, furnishing power to Birmingham, Danbury, and Brookfield. There is no finer view within 60 miles of New York than from the top of Ned's Mountain. It is unclear whether the Armstrongs owned their homestead. While their names appear on no deeds of ownership for the land records, it is possible there were deeds that were never filed with the town clerk in Ridgefield. Since they no doubt had little money, their home and other buildings in the compound were probably of basic construction perhaps not much more than small cottages, like the ones shown here from the 19th century. Nonetheless, the Armstrongs were willing to share what little they had with the fleeing enslaved who had much less. The Underground Railroad was an elaborate but loosely organized network of stations usually in people's private homes, but sometimes in businesses and churches. Men, women, and even children fleeing slavery could find assistance and shelter from these locations as they traveled northward. The network extended across all the northern states from the Atlantic shore to Iowa. Many runaways were fleeing to Canada where slavery was completely illegal and where slave hunters could not apprehend them. Others headed to northern and western New York or northern New England where slavery was so unpopular pursuers had less chance of successfully catching or holding them. Several tracks took runaways into and through Connecticut. While some of the fleeing men and women found permanent homes in Connecticut, most in the 1830s and 1840s probably continued on to at least Massachusetts and Vermont, where anti-slavery sentiment was stronger than in Connecticut, which had many ties to the South and its cotton-producing plantations. Massachusetts had banned slavery in 1783, more than a half century before Connecticut got around to doing it. The Underground Railroad did not involve a map with clearly defined routes, and instead was an informal network of stations whose interconnections changed constantly. No one knows how many stations there were, and station masters usually needed to know only nearby stations to the north along the lines so that they could provide the directions or transportation to the next safe destination. Sometimes the runaways had to travel to the next station on their own, but often they were carried 
or led by a conductor who frequently provided a ride in a wagon. In Wilton, the next town to the south of Ridgefield, William Wakeman, considered the town's foremost abolitionist, was both a station master and a conductor and would transport his packages of hardware and dry goods to places as distant as 50 miles or more. From New York City, many fleeing slaves traveled to Connecticut along the coast. Some who took this southern line into Connecticut then veered north on a route that led them up the Norwalk and Housatonic River valleys, while others continued on to New Haven, only then heading north to Farmington and Hartford, or northeasterly toward northern Rhode Island. Another track from New York City employed the Hudson River Valley. Some would follow that route all the way to Lake Champlain and on to Montreal, while others would veer off to western New York and head for Buffalo and cross to Canada there. Still others would head eastward via a number of routes into western Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Vermont. The locations of many stations are known, as this map prepared by state historians several years ago indicates, but many others remain unknown because of their secrecy. Two threats prompted that secrecy. The first, of course, were the many southern and some northern professional slave catchers. Although harboring escaped slaves was illegal, local officials in Connecticut often looked the other way and sometimes even helped runaways. Nevertheless, legal and illegal slave catchers were active in Connecticut, often aggressively chasing blacks all the way from the south into and beyond the state. The second threat came from the state of Connecticut itself, which in 1835 enacted a fugitive slave law, declaring that any slave escaping from another state would not be considered free in Connecticut and could be apprehended if the owner demanded it. The fugitives who succeeded in reaching the nutmeg state could look for no official help in their quest for freedom, said one historian. Then, in 1850, Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Act, far worse than the state law. Not only slave catchers, but also ordinary citizens were empowered to apprehend suspected slaves who were brought before a local official to determine whether they should be freed or sent south. These officials were compensated $10 per person who was declared a slave and $5 per person who was set free not a merciful incentive. What's more, anyone who helped or sheltered a runaway could be fined a thousand dollars and sent to jail for up to six months. But anyone who falsely reported a free black as a slave was not subject to any penalty. It was clear that the law powered through Congress by Southern interests, favored Southern slave owners at the expense of the right to a fair trial and even fair treatment. While the Armstrongs may have hosted guests who had come north via the Norwalk River Valley or across the Hudson River Valley, we can only guess where they sent or led their visitors on the next stage of their journey. New Milford to the north was known as a small center for Underground Railroad activity, and Farmington to the northeast was a major Connecticut hub. Most stations appear to have been operated by whites, including a number of religious leaders 
chiefly Congregational or Baptist. The Armstrongs may have been among the relatively few stops run by African Americans. So far, only two accounts have been found reporting the Armstrongs' involvement in the Underground Railroad. The 1879 article in the New York Tribune was contributed by a writer identified only as S., who lived in Brooklyn, New York, but who clearly knew Ridgebury and its people. Uncle Ned, the writer said, was a man who devoted a life to an idea, the freedom of his colored brother, brethren of the South. And so well did he plan and execute that to this day, Captain John Rockwell, Smith Keeler, George Bowden, and other near neighbors only knew Uncle Ned and Aunt Betsy as good, kind colored people, handy to have around to assist with the house or farm work. Some of these neighbors, the Tribune article said, helped Armstrong build their, quote, mansion near the top of the mountain. Quote, it was noticed that many colored men came and went, that officers often searched for certain colored men at the mansion, but never found them. No keeper of a railroad station was ever more faithful than were Uncle Ned and Aunt Betsy, the keepers of the Ned's Mountain Station on the underground route from the south to Canada. Behind the house, the writer said, is a cave that furnished a hiding place and shelter for the weary liberty seekers. And there, Uncle Ned and Aunt Betsy supplied food and clothing until rested and refreshed under the darkness of night they would flee from this land of freedom to Canada. Even the existence of the cave, so well did Uncle Ned guard its secret, never became known except to one person, B.D. Norris, until after Mr. Lincoln had made all the slaves free. Today, Few people know about the cave, and even fewer its whereabouts, which is on private property. The hillsides near the top of Ned's Mountain are, in many places, steep rocky cliffs that are filled with crevices. One of these crevices, like the narrow gap shown here, could have led to a small chamber that hid the freedom seekers. The Rockwells, Keelers, and Boutons, described as near neighbors, were in fact close to the Armstrong homestead on Ned's Lane, as you can see in this 1856 map. B.D. Norris was a farmer who lived at the eastern end of George Washington Highway, which was a mile away. You can see his name at the upper right. Why he knew about this station is unknown. S.'s report in the Tribune was dated June 7, 1879, but appeared in print in July and may have been sparked by reports that spring of an unusual find in Ridgefield. The New Haven Register carried a story June 17, 1879, under the headline, A Ridgefield Mystery. The discovery of a skeleton in a cave at Ridgefield is causing some speculation, the article said. Many years ago, Uncle Ned and Aunt Betsy, a colored couple, and most diligent agents of the Underground Railway, lived nearby, and many a fugitive slave traveling from the south to Canada found a refuge with them. These guests were always hidden in the cave, an enclosure about 20 square feet with a very small opening, and some people think the skeleton may have belonged to one of them. The skeletons belonging to a runaway slave seems unlikely since the Armstrongs were, by this and the Tribune accounts, 
devoted to helping slaves and would hardly have left a dead or dying person in their cave. In fact, as will be seen shortly, discoveries about the subsequent residents of Ned's Mountain may explain the bones and actually provide the name of the person to whom they belonged. The speculation about the skeleton may have prompted S. to write his account. Nonetheless, the two reports in separate publications both provide evidence that the Armstrongs were part of the Underground Railroad. How long their operation lasted can only be guessed. Old age, or perhaps illness, had probably ended their efforts by 1850. The family began disappearing from Ridgefield in the 1850s. Ned Armstrong died in 1851 at the age of 67 of dropsy of the heart, which was a term for heart failure. Betsy Armstrong died in 1857 of infirmities of age, they are buried together in Ridgebury Cemetery. As if an underground railroad stop situated on Ned's Mountain wasn't amazing enough, we have the fact that five young men of color who lived at this compound were later among the first to respond to the news that African Americans could finally fight in the Civil War. That includes four African Americans, two grandsons of Ned and Betsy Armstrong, and two brothers named Halstead, who were connected with the Armstrong family, and a fifth man, who may have been a native of the Kingdom of Hawaii, also called the Sandwich Islands. And although these five served and two died in the Union Army, Not one is remembered on a monument in the town of Ridgefield, though they are in Danbury, New Haven, and elsewhere. After the Civil War began in April of 1861, Connecticut and its towns and cities called for volunteers to join the Union Army. But those calls were not directed at black men. While Congress in 1862 passed an act belatedly allowing the enlistment of African-American soldiers, many officials in Connecticut, particularly members of the Democratic Party, opposed using blacks in the military. Connecticut Governor Alfred Buckingham, a friend of Lincoln and an outspoken supporter of emancipation, proposed legislation in 1863 allowing African Americans to serve. When he did so, says Connecticut historian Charles Hawley, Connecticut Democrats denounced the bill in unmeasured terms, arguing that it would let loose upon the helpless South a horde of African barbarians. They predicted black cowardice, disgrace, and ruin as a result of the experiment. Nonetheless, with an ever-increasing need for more soldiers, Governor Buckingham managed in November 1863 to persuade the General Assembly to allow the creation of a state regiment of black soldiers called the 29th Regiment Colored of Connecticut Volunteers. Unlike the Revolutionary War, where most military units were integrated, the Civil War officially had only segregated regiments. Integration in the 29th was limited to the officers, all white. An army regiment consisted of about 600 men. So many African Americans volunteered that a second regiment, the 30th, had to be formed almost immediately to accommodate all of them. It is interesting to note that in 1860, 8,726 blacks were living in Connecticut, 
of whom only 2,206 were men between the ages of 15 and 50 and eligible to serve in the war. Records indicate that 1,764 men of color eventually served in Connecticut, an astounding 78% of those eligible. Of those volunteers, 15% died in the service. Only 48% of the eligible white men served in the war. Cousins John S. Smalley and John Watson and brothers George Washington Halstead and Prince Albert Halstead had grown up in an environment that had aided slaves fleeing from the South. They no doubt heard accounts of the horrors of slavery directly from its victims or in stories told by their parents. The work of Ned and Betsy Armstrong may well have influenced their decisions to show up in Bridgeport in late 1863 to volunteer for the fight. They were all assigned to the new 29th Regiment. Born around 1846, John S. Smalley was only six years old when his father died. His mother passed away two years later, leaving him an orphan. He was probably cared for by his aunt, Betsy Watson, until he got older. At some point, Frederick Starr became John's guardian. Starr, in 1860, was a 28-year-old butcher with a wife and two small children living on Elm Street in Danbury. He later operated a grocery store in that city. Smalley may have been in training with Starr, perhaps as an indentured servant, to become a butcher. However, when Smalley was only 18 years old and volunteered to join the Union Army, he gave his occupation as laborer, a wide-ranging term that could include anything from farming to ditch digging. And since he was not yet an adult, Smalley needed permission of a parent or guardian to sign up. In an affidavit dated November 27, 1863, Frederick Starr stated, I hereby give consent to have John S. Smalley, my ward, enlist in the service of the United States for a term of three years. Smalley was assigned to Company B of the 29th Regiment. The men of the 29th were paid less than their white counterparts and suffered other forms of discrimination. When Smalley enlisted, black soldiers were paid $3 a month less than whites and had to contribute to the cost of their uniforms, which whites did not have to do. They may even have been cheated out of money due to them for their service. In a history of the 29th Regiment, Sergeant Isaac Hill described the inducements held out to men to join this regiment, including, quote, they were to receive a bounty of $310 from the state, $75 from the county from which they enlisted, and $300 from the United States. The $310 from the state was received. The other bounties we did not receive. Hill, by the way, served as regiment orderly, probably because he could read and write. He was also an African Methodist Episcopal minister. The 29th spent a couple of months training in New Haven. Today, a monument to the regiment stands in New Haven's Cosculo Park, where training took place. It lists on its stones the names of all the members of the regiment. The 29th left for Beaufort, South Carolina in March of 1864. After a brief stint there and at Hilton Head, 
which had been taken earlier by Union troops, the regiment was sent to Virginia, where it participated in the fighting to take Petersburg and Richmond. Like so many engagements in the Civil War, the battles were fierce and the aftermaths ugly. Quote, When I looked upon the dead and wounded, it was awful to see the piles of legs and arms that the surgeons cut off and threw in heaps on the ground, Sergeant Hill said in his history. During this fighting on October 27th, John Smalley was wounded, quote, while on skirmish line at a place called Kell House. His casualty report said he suffered a severe spine injury. Hill did not think much of the medical attention injured black soldiers were receiving. Many cases could be saved by a little care and attention after the battle, but the complexion and rank of a man has a great bearing, he said. There was a great distinction made among the wounded, so much so that it would make the heart of any Christian ache to see men treated so like brutes. Despite this injury, Smalley recuperated and was back in service within a few weeks, though he seems to have been reassigned to a less strenuous work as a company cook instead of a soldier. Members of the 29th were among the first Union troops to enter Richmond after it was abandoned by the Confederacy in 1865. And on April 4th, they witnessed a visit by the president. As Abraham Lincoln walked more than a mile from the James River to Jefferson Davis's former headquarters, many people lined the streets cheering. Hill vividly described the scene. All could see the president, he was so tall. One woman standing in a doorway as he passed along shouted, thank you dear Jesus for this sight of the great conqueror. President Lincoln walked in silence, acknowledging the salute of officers and soldiers and of citizens colored and white. Five days later, Lee surrendered at Appomattox, and 11 days later, Lincoln was dead. Toward the end of April, the 29th Regiment sailed from Richmond for Norfolk via the James River, and then for South Texas with a stop at New Orleans. The troops arrived in Brazos on the southernmost coast of Texas on July 7th, part of a 50,000-man force along the Gulf Coast and the Rio Grande, dealing with relations with Mexico and with the beginnings of Reconstruction in Texas. To reach the fort at Brownsville, the 29th Regiment had to march 20 miles inland through mosquito-infested swamps and waters sometimes waist-deep. Many members of the regiment became sick and wound up hospitalized, including both John Smalley and Isaac Hill. It was a nightmare, Hill recalled. There were 700 sick in this hospital, 400 of that number in the ward with me, he said. The hospital stewards and nurses were men with no human feelings. The poor sick were dying, 10 per day, and before they were cold, the hospital stewards would search them and take anything valuable that they found about them before they reported them dead. Hill survived, John Smalley didn't. He died of dysentery on September 27th in that hospital. During its war service, the 29th Regiment lost a total of 198 men, including 45 killed or mortally wounded in battle. More than three times that number, 153 men, succumbed 
to disease. Two days after Smalley died, word came that the regiment was ordered home to Connecticut to be disbanded. Smalley was buried in a national cemetery on the post at Brownsville. However, in 1909, more than 1,500 soldiers who were interred at Fort Brownsville were moved to Alexandria National Cemetery in Pineville, Louisiana. Thus, John Smalley's remains lie today in the Deep South, a land whose soldiers he had fought and from which fled slaves his grandparents may have assisted. Although he was born in Ridgefield, the name of John Smalley is not found on any monument or in any history book in his native town. However, it is engraved in stone in Worcester Cemetery in Danbury. There, a monument dedicated in 2007 honors African Americans from Greater Danbury who served in the Civil War. A year later, a larger multi-stone monument bearing the names of all the men in the 29th Regiment was completed in New Haven's Cosculo Park. John Smalley and his cousin, John J. Watson, grew up together on Ned's Mountain. In 1850, when the census takers stopped by, Watson was nine years old and Smalley four. Their mothers were sisters. The two may have traveled together from Danbury to Bridgeport to sign up for the Army. They both enlisted on November 27, 1863. Watson was at least 21 years old and didn't need the permission that Smalley, a minor, had to have from an adult. Watson was in the same company, B, as his cousin, and they no doubt saw much action together, including the Richmond-Petersburg campaign. But John Watson escaped injury and was never reported hospitalized with an illness. He was mustered out of the service in Brownsville in October 1865, returned to Connecticut, and seems to have vanished. No record of his life after the war or of his death has been found. By 1860, new families had moved into the compound on Ned's Mountain. The census shows Prince Halstead, 63, and his wife, Sarah, 50, along with children, George Washington, 20, Prince Albert, 13, and Mary E., 16, living there. Living in the same compound were members of the Ramerson family, who we'll meet later. It is hard to tell when the Smalleys and the Watsons left and the Halsteads and Ramersons arrived. Since there are no deeds on the land records for these families, the censuses provide snapshots of who was living there once every 10 years. L that leaves to the imagination and a few birth and death records what was happening in between. There may have been points at which some or all of the Smalleys, Watsons, Halsteads, and Ramersons were living there at the same time. Prince Halstead was no newcomer to Ridgefield. He shows up in the 1840 census living in Ridgebury. By 1850, he was in North Salem, New York, working on a farm on the east side of the lower end of Peach Lake, not far from the Richfield line. Prince and Sarah's sons, George Washington and Prince Albert Halstead, may have envisioned enlisting in the Union Army as a way of fighting slavery, of supporting their country, and even of finding adventure. It wound up a tragedy for Albert. 
Both George and Albert enlisted in December of 1863, as soon as African Americans were allowed to join Connecticut regiments. Albert may have been only about 16 or 17 years old. They were assigned to Company E of the 29th Regiment and were sent to a camp in New Haven that provided the basic training. Both were also immediately hospitalized with illnesses. Albert spent nearly three months in Knight General Hospital, a military facility in New Haven, suffering from typhoid fever. For some reason, he was returned to duty on April 5, 1864. Ten days later, he died. His medical record says he died of typhoid pneumonia. His death was tragic, but not unusual. Two-thirds of the 620,000 soldiers who died in the Civil War lost their lives to disease, not wounds. Although there are indications Albert was buried in Worcester Cemetery in Danbury, no gravestone for him exists today. It is possible that a government-sponsored marker was created. An order for a federal gravestone was reportedly filled, but records show that the stone would have erroneously stated that he served in a Massachusetts regiment. Perhaps the stone was rejected because of the error, and somehow a replacement was never acquired. Private Albert Halstead is, however, listed on the Worcester Cemetery Monument to African Americans who served in the Civil War. At training camp, Brother George Washington Halstead came down immediately with measles and mumps and was also sent to Knight General Hospital. George recovered. George Washington Halstead went on to serve in the 29th Regiment at Beaufort, South Carolina, and in the gruesome Richmond Petersburg campaigns in Virginia. He must have been an outstanding soldier because he was promoted to corporal and then to sergeant. One of his comrades was the Reverend Alexander Heritage Newton, commissary sergeant for the 29th, who noted in his autobiography that Sergeant Halstead was wounded in a, quote, fierce encounter on September 29, 1864, three miles outside Richmond. This battle was indeed a slaughter pen, Newton wrote. The enemy fought like tigers. Sergeant Halstead recovered from his wound and was with the 29th at Brownsville, Texas after the war ended and the regiment was finally mustered out of service. After the war, George Halstead returned to farm work. In 1870, he and his family were living in North Salem, probably on a farm at the very south end of Peach Lake, not far from where his father had worked in 1850. George and his wife, Victoria, had two daughters, Alagatha, eight, and Emma, seven, living with them, along with George's father, Prince. A son, George, born in 1858, was apparently living elsewhere. George Washington Halstead died April 12, 1874, only 31 years old. Victoria died a year later. He is buried in Ridgebury Cemetery, where the American Legion places a flag on his monument each Memorial Day. This picture shows the gravestones of three generations of Halsteads buried together in Ridgebury Cemetery. Number two is Civil War veteran George Halstead, and three, Victoria, his wife, Four is Prince Halstead, his father, and five, Sarah Halstead, his mother, while number one is his daughter, Emma J. Halstead, who was 16 when she died. 
Many mysteries surround Ned's Mountain and its, its compound, but perhaps none is unusual as the identity of Prince Ramerson. Described in the 1860 census as a 23-year-old farmhand living in one of the homes with three members of his family. Prince was a name fairly common among African Americans in the 18th and early 19th centuries. Prince Halstead and Prince Albert Halstead were living in the same compound. Often, the name was aimed at reflecting a royal descent from ancestors in Africa. Ramerson, however, was a surname that was unusual in this region for persons of any race at any time. There was one notable exception. A Prince Ramerson, born in the Kingdom of Hawaii around 1840, came to New York and New England served in the Union Navy, blockading Confederate ports during the Civil War, then joined the Union Army to fight the Confederacy on land, and finally wound up being one of the U.S. Army's Buffalo Soldiers in the post-war West. Was the census takers Prince Ramerson the same as Hawaii's Prince Ramerson? A death report in Ridgefield's town hall records adds weight to the possibility that the two were the same. On April 17, 1854, a laborer reported as John Samerson died in Ridgefield at the age of 60. Like Prince Romerson, the soldier and sailor, Samerson very close to Ramerson or Romerson, was born in Hawaii, the Sandwich Islands, according to the Richfield Town Hall death record. His race was described as copper, and he had succumbed to bilious fever. Was John Samerson the father of Prince Ramerson? What are the odds of a native of Hawaii named John Samerson being in the same small New England town at the same time as someone named Prince Ramerson, possibly also from Hawaii, unless they were connected? How could such variations in a name occur? Several causes may be involved including the fact that Ramerson, spelled R-A-M-O-R-S-O-N, um, and Romerson, R-O-M-O-R-S-O-N, were probably illiterate and did not know how to spell their own names. Census takers, ministers, and town officials guesstimated how it should be spelled. The R and S difference, Ramerson, Samerson, may reflect misunderstandings of handwriting when copying records. Prince Romerson was the subject of a four-page biography in the 2015 book Asians and Pacific Islanders and the Civil War, not to mention a 1,500-word profile on Wikipedia, the online encyclopedia. He was born around 1840 in Hawaii, then a kingdom which became a U.S. territory in 1900. Very little is known of his early life, but he was reported to be living in the American Northeast before the war. If the Ramersons and Samersons were the same family, at least some of them were in Ridgefield by 1854 when John Samerson died. One was William Samerson, who died of consumption in 1859 in Ridgefield at the age of 33. He may have been a son of John and a brother of Prince. William's death may explain the origin of the mysterious skeleton found in 1879 
in the secret cave the Armstrongs had probably used for the Underground Railroad. Hawaiians are known to have used caves for burials. According to Hawaiian historian Betty Fullard Leo, burial caves have been found on every Hawaiian island. Most chiefly families, that is royal families, are believed to have had their own secret burial caves, the location of which was closely guarded by the family. Sometimes stone walls that looked like the surrounding cliffs were cleverly constructed to hide a cave entrance. Other sources say commoners also used caves to inter their dead well into the Christian period. What happened to the 1879 skeleton that may have belonged to William Samerson has not been learned but it probably was interred in an unmarked grave, perhaps in Ridgebury Cemetery. By 1863, Prince Romerson was in New York City where he enlisted in the Union Navy, not a surprising choice since he came from the Sandwich Islands, most of whose inhabitants were close to the sea. Records indicate he had worked as a barber before enlisting. For a year, he served aboard vessels including the USS Mercadita, shown here, as part of a squadron maintaining the blockade of Confederate ports. By May of 1864, he had left the Navy for unknown reasons and was in Boston, where he joined the Union Army. He was assigned to the 5th Regiment Massachusetts Colored Volunteer Cavalry, possibly because of his past experience or an ability to read and write. He was almost immediately promoted to sergeant. Romerson fought in the Second Battle of Petersburg and, as did members of Connecticut's 29th Regiment, took part in the whole bitter Richmond-Petersburg campaign. After the war ended, his regiment with Connecticut's 29th was sent to Texas, but Romerson was taken ill like so many of the other soldiers were. He recuperated in New Orleans and then at a hospital and on an island off New Rochelle, New York, before being mustered out of the service with his regiment October 9th, 1865. Apparently fond of the military and the adventure it had offered, Romerson enlisted in 1867 as a private in what became the 25th United States Infantry Regiment, a racially segregated unit of the United States Army. It was dubbed the Buffalo Soldiers and included many Civil War veterans from colored regiments. Serving at least three years, Romerson fought in the American Indian Wars with the 25th. Despite Hollywood portrayals that invariably ignore their participation, men of color made up one-fifth of the regular army in the post-war West. He died on March 30, 1872, of unstated causes possibly at Fort Griffith, Texas, and is buried in the San Antonio National Cemetery. Perhaps it is no surprise that his gravestone bears yet another version of his name, Prince Roerson. By 1870, no people of color were left on Ned's Mountain, and only one of the old cottages on the compound appears to have been in use. It was occupied by Irish immigrants, Pat and Mary Hartell, and their three children, Mary, Maggie, and Patrick. Four decades of being a refuge for people fleeing enslavement and a home to people who fought slavery had ended. 
Today, nothing visible remains of the Armstrong compound. The east side of the lane is steep and wooded, with a modern house at its summit. The lane itself leads to a back entrance to a large estate. The former McKeon Farm, more recently called Double H Farm, for its owner, the late E. Hunter Harrison. Ironically, Hunter Harrison was a leading North American railroad executive. Thank you so much, Jack. What a thorough presentation. Um, and welcome to the program. Um, I'm going to uh, begin to invite people to put their questions um, into the Q&A, and I've got a few here already. So let's get starting started. Uh, oh, hi, host. Your ceiling is fantastic. <laughs> I'm ri missing Ridgefield and New England. Thank you. Um, so here's a question for Jack. Um, if Ned and Betsy did not have a deed to prove ownership for their land, what is the disposition of their old homestead today, privately or town owned? It, it's private property there, um, although very nearby is the um, huge uh, Hemlock Hills Preserve that uh, uh, along Ned's Mountain Road at the, the northern side. But uh, right there, it's all private property which makes it kind of difficult to go looking for that cave. Here's another question. Is it possible to climb on Ned's Mountain today and see the view or is that private property? I guess Again, that's... Yeah. That, that house, uh, I'm not sure it's on the market now, but it was just recently on the market. The, the house is at the top of the, uh, the mountain. Uh, it's a very modern one story, house that I think uh, has a lot of glass and takes advantage of the views. Uh, here's just someone who uh, says thank you and that they very much enjoyed the presentation. Um, someone else said, great, thank you so much. Are there any known stops on the Underground Railroad in North Salem, Purdy's or Croton Falls that you are aware of? Um, no, and I, you know, I, it's, and there could well be but I just don't know that much about uh, Northern Westchester history. Um, and, you know, that's one of the problems in, of, of, that I'm trying to address in the work that I do. Um, a lot of local history, especially as it uh, addresses African-Americans has never been done. Um, there, there's so little, so few communities uh, in Connecticut and, and probably in Westchester have um, spent any effort on um, tracing their um, African-American backgrounds and uh, uh, the, 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 the part that African-Americans played in the, the, the early years of their, their towns. Uh, and that's, that's one thing I hope to solve or at least address uh, with this research, which is still going on uh, into not only um, Ned's Mountain, but uh, uh, 18th century uh, slaves in Ridgefield and 18th century uh, soldiers who served in the American Revolution. And there were at least seven Ridgefield people of color who served uh, in the American Revolution. Thank you. There's another question. Has there been any attempt to add the names of the two fallen soldiers on the Ridgefield Monument? If not, uh, why not? Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's hard to it's very hard to to add something to to those monuments. I mean, those um, I, I think that perhaps something separate is, is going to have to be done. Uh, uh, it, 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 those are all, you know, engraved plates uh, on the war memorial. So it, it's very difficult. But some, they, they, all, all these soldiers. Uh, uh, there's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I think I've counted sixteen 
um, revolutionary and uh, Civil War soldiers from Ridgefield, only six of whom are recognized on uh, any monuments in town. Uh, I, I think, you know, there, sh there should be some sort of a formal official recognition, recognition of them. Mm -hmm. So another question, is there any evidence that Prince Rowerson served in the 25th Infantry Bicycle Corps stationed out of Fort Miziola, Montana? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 what year would that be? I, 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 I don't know about that. I, I think that most of his service in the uh, with the Buffalo Soldiers was uh, closer to Texas in uh, uh, the southern part, uh, but he, he may have been up in Montana. I don't know. So the the person who asked the question replied, "1896." If that's any help. What year? 1896. Oh, he he was long dead. <laughs> okay. He died in uh, 1876 or someplace around there. 1872. Okay. So there's lots of thank yous coming in, which is lovely. Um, next question. Uh, again, this is a similar question. Are there any plans to honor them in Ridgeberry specifically? Um, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, the Ridgeberry Congregational Church did something because they're very active uh, and very interested in um, their community's history. And I wouldn't uh, be surprised if the Armstrongs uh, were not um, participants in, in, in that church in some way. I, 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 I wouldn't, I, I bet you they were. I mean, it, it's quite possible. So Deborah was on the call, but she had to leave because she's doing a service, but um, that's something to investigate. So she from Ridgebury Congregational Church was on the call today. Um, we have a comment from Beth. Thank you, Mr. Sanders. What do we know about the sentiment in Ridgefield on issues like the Fugitive Slave Act during the antebellum period? Um, it, if you go to the Ridgefield Library's website and uh, go to their section on research and look under there in the section on genealogy and local history, you'll find um, the latest version of Uncle Ned's Mountain, which is actually a, a book about all of the research I've been doing. And there's a, a large um, portion of that book is deals with uh, pre-war, pre-Civil War, um, Ridgefield and what the attitudes may have been of the people who lived here. Um, it might surprise people to to, to, to see some of this. Uh, there were some very enlightened people here and there were also some people that weren't so enlightened. And uh, um, that's all in there. It's downloadable. You can read it on your own computer. I don't think you want to print it out because it's 184 pages, but it's, uh, uh, and it's, it's uh, extensively illustrated. So it's got more, more pictures than you saw today. And uh, I think that would answer the, the, the question about what Richfielders were thinking back then. Um, do you know the name of the farm in North Salem where they were working? Uh, who, the Armstrongs? Um, let's see. Uh, can Helen, can you uh, reply again in the question box so I can uh, feed that to Jack. Is that who you're referring to? The Armstrongs would have had their own, um, you know, little tiny farm, their own small farm, and they would have probably worked for the Keelers nearby, the Bowtons. Um, that that map that I showed from 1856 shows some of the uh, nearby families, and they probably did work for them as well. Uh, no reply, so thank you for answering that. Um, 
Is the Phyllis who was associated with Ridgebury Church part of one of these families? She was the earliest known Black church member in the 1800s. I, 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 I've, I've seen her. I, I remember she was admitted to the church. Um, and um, But unfortunately, there's no last name for her. So I don't, I don't know. Uh, and I have not dug into her background, but she is mentioned in the book. Um, but, uh, I, I, but I don't know whether she's connected or how she might be connected because one of the problems is this is in the, the 17, late 1700s and the census probably would not have picked her up. Mm -hmm. So another comment, thank you for this presentation. Do, you, do we have any information on the current descendants of those original Ned's Mountain inhabitants? Boy, I wish I could find some. I've, I've, uh, I've put out feelers on various, uh, uh, you know, genealogical boards and both them, uh, the Armstrongs and the Jacqueline families who were settlers here in the 1740s, 50s and 60s, uh, you know, they, they helped settle the town originally. Uh, and I've been trying to find descendants uh, who might know some more about what happened to the, those families and what happened to the people that have seemed to have disappeared. Uh, but that's one of the things about uh, getting this information out on the internet. Um, and one of the reasons why I post them uh, like on the library site and, and other places so that as many people can see them as possible and maybe find connections, um, maybe see connections, maybe find their ancestors, maybe uh, uh, provide more information, more uh, clues as to what happens to these families. I mean, there's so many of the African-Americans, uh, the revolutionary soldiers in particular, after the war, they just disappear. You can't, you can't find them. You can't figure, figure out what happened to them. And it's really a shame. So another comment, um, does Ned's Mountain get its name from Ned Armstrong? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. And Allison says, there used to be a cemetery in the Triangle, Ned's Mountain yes. and Ridgebury Corner. Yes. That old timers said had gravestones that were taken away and used as foundation material. Any knowledge of any of the stones removed were perhaps those of the Ned's descendants. Well, I think that cemetery ceased being used before the uh, um, quite a bit before 1850. That was an Episcopal. There was an Episcopal church in Ridgebury in that triangle. That triangle is a uh, formed by Ridgebury Road, Ned's Mountain Road, and, and now uh, a, a, a lane that is probably private on the, um, is it Spruce Ridge Farm, the, the horse riding farm up there, I think. Um, in, in there was a, an Episcopal church and there was a cemetery um, that has uh, pretty much vanished, but I'm sure there are I'm sure there are bodies buried there still, even though the stones have all disappeared. This is a comment from Kay Abels. Uh, thank you, Jack, for your wonderful research. As usual, you've added another layer to Ridgefield history. Uh, I am very, this is another question. I am very surprised to learn about someone from Hawaii ending up in Ridgefield in the 1800s. What kind of trip was that? Well, the Hawaiians were seafaring people. I mean, they're, they're, they're islanders, and it's not surprising that they uh, would uh, quite possibly take advantage of the many whaling vessels that uh, visited um, the Sandwich Islands uh, in the, you know, early to mid uh, 19th century. Um, that was a place that they, they stopped and uh, uh, got uh, supplies. And uh, so islanders who were seeking a little bit more adventure 
could very well have joined the crews of uh, some of these uh, whaling vessels. And of course, Connecticut was a, and uh, nearby Massachusetts were centers of um, the whaling industry. Uh, so it's not surprising that uh, somebody from the Sandwich Islands could wind up here uh, uh, in, this, in this part of the, the world. How they wound up in Ridgefield is probably, you know, word of mouth. There's a job available. Um, mm -hmm. uh, maybe friends, maybe family had already been here. So another question, there are probably no written records of how many slaves escaped using the Underground Railroad. Are there any estimates, best guesses? Uh, the entire Underground Railroad? Uh, across the country? Specify. Yeah. Um, there have been various estimates of you know, the tens of thousands of people and how you know how many per year uh, uh, might have uh, made it to freedom, thanks to that service, um, from say the eighteen tens all the way up until just before the Civil War. Um, but uh, there's no, there's no way of knowing exactly. Um, so, some people um, kept records. Uh, um, there's a, a, a a man in Philadelphia or uh, Baltimore, I can't remember his name, who uh, not only kept records, but interviewed uh, many of the people passing through and, um, and uh, ha had their, has written down their stories and uh, published a book about it. It's, uh, there's, there's quite a bit of testimony from um, slaves who use the Underground Railroad um, that makes fascinating reading. Some of the stories they tell about the adventures they uh, went through is, is just astounding. It's astounding. Unfortunately, so there's, a... there's nothing directly, you know, meant that I found mentioning um, the Ridgebury uh, uh, station. Uh, it would be really nice to be able to, you know, get some kind of testimony. And it may be out there somewhere. It's, uh, that's, again, why you want to get as much of uh, these kind of early records online, accessible to researchers so that they can share information, which the Richfield Historical Society is in the process of doing. Right? Indeed. Um Another question, any chance they attended Ridgebury Congregational Church? Do we know when the church was founded in Ridgebury? The, the church was founded in the 1750s and uh, they had a building but in the seven, 1760s, I believe. Um, so yes, it's possible they attended the, the, the services there. Uh, there is, I don't believe there's any record of them being admitted as members. Um, but I have not been able to, I've, you know, asked the uh, church about it, but I have not been able to, uh, uh look at the records themselves, uh, to see if maybe, a, an Armstrong or a Halstead or, uh, any of those, uh, uh families might've, uh, been members. Hmm. So here's a person who uh, used to explore the caves as a young teen and hasn't been there in about 50 years, but he believes he could still find them. Uh, there was an old homestead somewhat near the cave when I was a kid. Uh, that's his comment and he wanted to thank you uh, for the program. So moving on to the next question, do you think the town should establish a historical marker in the area of Ned's Mountain to honor the memory of Ned and Betsy Armstrong and their role in the Underground Railroad? That would be very nice. There might be something the historical society could do. Um, the historical society has these wonderful, uh, um, what is it, history in the streets, or uh, what's the name of that? Uh, Museum series? in the streets. What? Museum in the streets. Yes, Museum in the streets. Uh, series of markers that are uh, in many places in town. 
include, I think there's one in Ridgebury up by the Ridgebury Congregational Church. And there could be something similar to that there. It would be very appropriate, but of course, <laughs> This is way out of the way and very few people would come upon it. But but noted, but noted. Yeah, it would um, be a good thing. A good thing. Um, has Jack collaborated at all with Mark Robinson, who I believe may have done some research on the Buffalo Soldiers? I have sent my material to Mark and I, I have not heard from him about uh, uh, any suggestions that he might have, but he has uh, seen um, what I've written. So I think this is a comment as a follow-up to an earlier question. Phyllis was servant of Timothy Benedict, church member 1790. So I don't know if that was in reference to uh, the first or one of the first black members of the congregational church. Um, Timothy Benedict. Timothy Ben. It's yeah, Benedict. It's spelled without a C, but I think I, I don't know if that's a typo. But Benedict or Benedict, church member from 1790, is what's in the comment. He, he's supposed to be African American. It just says Phyllis was a servant of Timothy. So, oh, a servant of. Oh, so okay. Not likely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Um. So, so she, she was probably enslaved. Right, right. Um, so <laughs> lots of thank yous. Um, someone is saying, I'm thinking of trying to coordinate a memorial for the Armstrongs and the vets. How can I talk, contact Jack Anderson? Also, can we access this recording for others? Yes, this program is being recorded and will be available on the Historical Society's website and YouTube channel next week. Um, anybody that wants to contact me, my email is Jack F. Sanders. Jack F. is in Frank Sanders at gmail.com. S, S A N D E R S, not Saunders. <laughs> um, so somebody was asking, will this fantastic info be added to Richfield student curriculum? Great you idea. know, that's a whole another thing that I could go on about forever, <laughs> about how lacking the school system's um, history program is in real local history. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's just very little being taught about not only, you know, just the African American side of Richfield's uh, early history, but, you know, the town's Aside from the Battle of Ridgefield, nobody ever talks about anything. I mean, what was life like in um, 1750 Ridgefield? Uh, what did people do? How did they make money? How did they survive? Uh, what did they eat? Uh, none of this is, uh, I don't believe, taught in the schools. And yet, this is a town in which many of these kids are growing up in and uh, yeah. uh, they should know something about their, their the community's roots and what it was like here. Uh, but it would be nice if the school system did more local history in this curriculum. We have a comment. I appreciate the research you've done on the subject as a black woman who raised her children in Wilton and moved to Ridgefield before relocating to Kingston, New York. I came across very little information about African Americans in the area. And that, you know, that's really a shame. It just, it, only one book that I have come across uh, in Fairfield County um, has uh, addressed um, early American, African American history. Um, and that was by a, um, a man from Newtown who taught at, um, I think at Joel Barlow in Reading, um, he did a, a, a history of uh, um, slave slavery in um, uh, Reading, Newtown, uh, Easton, Weston, that area. Uh, that's quite interesting. And um, but that is about it. And with all these, you know, even Norwalk, Danbury, um, cities, 
I think you'd find very little early history of African Americans, and it's really a shame. Um, and maybe, uh, maybe uh, uh, the more it's publicized, the more people will be interested in it and, and, and start doing some research. Mm -hmm. we're, um, fortunate, we're fortunate, by the way, in Richfield in that we have um, a complete set of records going back to the town's founding in 1708. One of the problems that somebody doing research like this in Danbury would have is that the the good old British burned the records in uh, 1777. And so a lot of what happened in the first century of Danbury's history has been lost. Um, in Norwalk's case, uh, a fire, the, the, minister, the minister town clerk had uh, all the records and his house caught fire and burned down and those things were destroyed. And so a lot of early Norwalk records are, are lost, but still um, these communities do have rich histories that uh, need to be uh, written about, explored and written about. Indeed. Um, another question, is the George Washington Highway named after the child George Washington? George Washington Highway is named after George Washington because the president but then general who used it as a uh, uh, part of his route uh, between New York and uh, meeting General Lafayette, I believe, uh, in Rhode Island or someplace, uh, Hartford, maybe. Um, and a lot of people don't realize this, but for a long time, Ridgebury Road was also called George Washington Highway. So George Washington Highway would be today's um, George Washington Highway, plus um, all the way down um, from the center of Ridgebury down to North Salem Road was also called George Washington Highway. Uh, and I think they did that um, in 1935 for some uh, big anniversary of Washington's birth or death or something. Uh, there was a big celebration back then. Um, but at some point they decided that that was too confusing. So they made the Ridgebury, what's today Ridgebury Road, they gave it its old name back and just left George Washington Highway, the section from the center of Ridgebury into Danbury. So here's a question about the Sandwich Islands. How did Hawaii get the name of the Sa Sandwich Islands? <laughs> I don't know. I don't <laughs> okay. know. I have enough trouble just trying to keep up with Richfield history. <laughs> but I have worked with some professors uh, um, from who did a lot of uh, Hawaiian research and writing and history. And uh, they, they, they helped out a lot with uh, my understanding of why we could have had these uh, um, this family in Richfield. Um, and they, they were quite interested in it. And, uh, uh, and, and I have posted information about this uh, on, on, on boards in Hawaii, so that if, if somebody is, happens to be running across this family and um, maybe doing research into it, may connect um, someday. Be, the, the trouble is a name like Ramerson or Samerson or whatever it was, was probably just made up. It was probably not their original Hawaiian name. It was some Anglicanization or uh, you know a, a, a name that they just chose because they liked the sound of it. Um, so it, it would be hard to, to actually trace these people back but it may be possible. Um, so here's a comment about, will there be lectures on Zoom about the recent Revolutionary War skeletons discovered in Ridgefield? Um, yes, we did one in December with the um, Emeritus State Archaeologist, Nick Bellantoni, which is on our website and viewable. And we are planning more um, follow-ups in the spring. Um, 
Thank you so much for an amazing pre presentation. Where can we find some of those stories of personal experiences with the Underground Railroad? Are there specific books that you can recommend? Um, well, I'll tell you. I have uh, collected a library of uh, several dozen volumes, but um, a, a, an interesting book. Um, that uh, um, has a lot of uh, um, classic uh, narratives is this, which was published by uh, Signet. Th these are mostly used books. I don't know whether uh, this is still in print, but it's uh, Henry Louis Gates, classic slave narratives. Um, there's a oh my gosh there's so many <laughs> but, uh, and unfortunately I have a very disorganized way of putting them here um, maybe we can create a reading list for after the program um, to send out to folks if they're interested or post it on our website when we post <laughs> Uh, this program. Another another book is uh, this one, which is um, called The Underground Railroad, A Comprehensive History by Wilbur Siebert. This is very um, early. This is, uh, uh, let's see, published in, um, this is a reprint of something that was published in uh, the late 1890s, but it has a lot of uh, first person uh, narratives in it. Um, and yes, I, um, I can pass that on. Uh, uh, the actually the at the at the library's website where you can download the book, the bibliography in that has um, many, many books um, on the subject of um, slavery, um, um, the Underground Railroad that um, I've read in connection with this study. So um, that would be a good place to look. Great. And someone responded about the Sandwich Islands named by James Cook, who discovered them in the 1770s after one of his benefactors, Duke or Earl of Sandwich. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, we've just got a few more uh, questions. Let's see. Have there been any other settlements of a group of black families living in Ridgefield since those on Ned's Mountain? Well, there were, there were quite a few black families living in Ridgefield in uh, various parts of the town. Um, the, the book, uh, which devotes the first hundred or so pages to the 18th century, talks about especially the Jacklin family, which helped settle very northern Ridgebury and also had um, a, a big farm in the very south end of town on the Wilton line uh, near um, probably Spectacle Lane, that, that area of town. Uh, and they were, uh, they, they came to, to Ridgefield in the 1740s um, and uh, contributed at least three or four sons to the American Revolution. Um, and uh, that family, unfortunately, was gone from town by 1800. Um, they, many of them moved west uh, following the call that uh, uh, a number of people did as, because farming was uh, uh, better in the flatter, less rocky soils of Western New York and Ohio and places like that. Um, so, um, so we lost those people, but, but they were um, a, a major 
family in town uh, in the 1800s, in the 1700s, and uh, you know contributed a lot. I mean, four, three or four sons to the American Revolution is, is um, pretty significant. So last few questions. Do you spend time going to various libraries and places of records like town halls to find stuff that's not online or even organized for that matter? The, one of my main sources is the, the, the old records in the town hall. Um, uh, I've spent many hours going through pages and pages and pages and pages of that uh, material. And it's, um, I've gotten pretty good at reading um, 18th century script, uh, which is not, it was just very neat and tidy and everything, but it's, it's different from what we were taught as kids and what nobody's being taught now, I guess. Um, but it's, uh, there's, it's, there's a lot of information and, and, and sometimes it's, it, it just pops out of places you don't expect to find it. Um, but also um, the, the original sources that you can find on uh, Ancestry. Um, um, I also uh, use an, a lot of newspaper databases. There's uh, some very good early newspaper databases that um, have uh, searchable copies of papers from the 17, 1700s and the early 1800s that are very, very useful in uh, trying to find out what's going on. You find some fascinating ads for um, escaped um, slaves. There's two from Ridgefield at least. Um, and one, uh, one ad in the 1730s uh, for a slave that belonged to Timothy Keeler sounded like one of the most interesting people that I've seen in Richfield. The, the fellow could read and write and play uh, 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 musical instruments uh, with uh, considerable skill. And uh, here he was enslaved. Um, and he, what he did is he, using his skills, wrote himself a pass and took off and apparently was never found again, it, it, you know, changed his name and uh, uh, began a new life. But uh, Timothy Keeler uh, advertised uh, in Boston and New York to try and uh, to try and get him back. And uh, I, I, I don't believe he did. So someone's asking, would an integrated cemetery have been unusual at that time? Um, I think they probably were um, in Richfield uh, integrated. I mean, they, they, they may have been a separate section devoted to uh, people of color, but I'm not, I don't know that for a fact. Um, I don't know of any 1700s gravestones of uh, African Americans in a, in a Richfield um, graveyard. Um, there may be, but they may have been um, lost long ago. Uh, I, there, there's no black cemetery in Richfield that I know of. The nearest that I have heard of is in Easton on, uh, I think it's Route 58. Um, there is a fairly well-known black cemetery, but uh, I think uh, African Americans were buried in the same cemeteries as everyone else. So, um, what is the name of Jack's book? I missed it the first go round. Well, the name of this is Uncle Ned's Mountain. And the book is available. Um, it's it's available at only electronically right now. I'm still writing it. I'm still perfecting it, so to speak. There's so much more to learn. And, uh, but I, I want what's done so far to be available so that people can understand that there is this rich history uh, of African-Americans in Ridgefield that uh, 
has been ignored and should be available. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Uh, I thought he was referring to this presentation. That's the name of the presentation and also the book. Yes. Well, um, the presentation, I think we called it Heroes of Ned's Mountain. The Heroes Mount. of Ned's Mountain. Maybe I should use that for the book, but the book is about a lot more than Ned's Mountain. Uh, Ned's Mountain is symbolic in the book uh, it, because this starts in the early 1700s in uh, Ridgefield and it spends a lot of time on, on slavery in Ridgefield and uh, on the Revolutionary War and on early settlers and who were black. Right, and this is another comment, David Scott, an early settler whose house is now the Ridgefield Historical Society headquarters had slaves. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yes. Um, and then I have the final question, which is, would you be willing to speak to the high school, middle school, or even elementary school students in the Ridgefield public schools? Not to put you on the spot, but there you go. Um, I'm, I'm willing to be available to answer questions. I would like, um, I mean, if a teacher wants um, to, do something about this in a, in a class, um, I would recommend that the, the students look at at least parts of Uncle Ned's Mountain, the book, and then we can just talk about it. But I, 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 I think it's better that, it, that they read what's been done um, or the teacher read it and explain it to the kids and then ask, I'm, I'm available to answer questions, but I don't, uh, I'm not a very great teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all the questions we have, um, Jack. I just wanna say thank you for this amazing presentation. Um, so informative well, and fascinating. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to do it. Um, our pleasure. And I just, for anyone who's still out there, stay tuned for our next webinar, The Cultural Phenomenon of Home DNA Testing, presented by author Libby Copeland on Tuesday, September 23rd at 7. You can uh, register at Ridgefield Historical Society, uh, org. And have a great evening, everyone. And thanks again, Jack. And thanks for joining us. Thank you. Good evening.